So today, we're going to start a new series. Hopefully, this will work if that comes on in a moment. There we go. Brilliant. Uh, today, we're going to start a new series, and we're calling it Culture Clash. And um, really, it's inspired by, I think, to be honest, it's inspired by a place where many of us have found ourselves in the last couple of years. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we did this kind of complaining morning, which was a lot of fun, great fun. Um, and... Also, just kind of sharing some of the things that we, you know, some of us just feel like we feel really alien in the world right now. And the world seems to be going away from the Lord and pushing God out of everything. And, and I think for us, there's a huge culture clash taking place. Where so, for so long, we've grown up in a nation which has kind of professed to uh, built its main principles, its pillars, if you like, on uh, Scripture and now we're a nation, a world really, particularly in the West, that are kind of rejecting that way of living. And they're asking questions and they're wondering whether God even has a place in the world. And it leaves us in a really tricky place because we're people that still believe that the Lord is very much real, uh, that he very much has a heart for the world, that he is very much at work and he impacts our lives and we're in this place of going, we can see the world rejecting something that we are not going to let go of. And it leaves us in this weird place of kind of like where our world and the world are coming to heads, you know. And it's tricky, right? And I think a lot of us have kind of felt like some of these people on here, you know, we just feel really conflicted, really confused. And it's impacting the way we live. It's impacting what we watch is impacting um, uh, where we, well, we'll get into some of it, we'll, you know, how we respond, I guess. Um, and maybe this, this last one I quite like, because I'm like, this is how I feel often. I'm, I'm going one way, suddenly flipping around and, like, what, what, yeah, uh, where am I going? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to act? And uh, we thought it'd be really helpful if we did a small series that talked about and acknowledged that we are in a bit of a, a culture clash at the moment. And we've got to work out how we are supposed to respond, all of us as individuals, to what's going on in the world. And I think this is really inspired by kind of seeing how the church has responded in different ways. So some churches are being really hard lined, like, no, we're going to stick to God's principles and we're going to let the whole world know about it, you know, that they're all... They're all on the path to hell. <laughs> they're in trouble, and they're holding this, this very firm uh, line. I don't know where anyone in this room stands on this stuff, but I'm just sharing the general view of, of different aspects of the church. You've got another arm of the church, if you like, who are um, certainly from a place of love and accept and say, well, God loves these people, and therefore it might be seen that they're compromising or changing some of their belief system to be accommodated in the world. Um, and maybe for us as individuals, we have that conflict as well. What we said at work maybe five years ago, we wouldn't say at work today. Maybe some of the views that we share or some of the views that we have, we're not confident in sharing them because we're worried about the perception of that, whether people will, uh, what they will think about us. And uh, it's, the truth is, being a Christian in this world is hard at times. It's really difficult. And I think we have to just put our hands up and acknowledge that sometimes it's hard being a Christian. But the truth is, I believe that our response needs to be quite varied depending on the situation. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at four areas. We're going to look at where are the areas in our Christian living where we just need to anchor down. Like this... This is what I believe. This is what I think is true. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand my ground. This is it. This, I'm a rock. I'm not going to move from this position. There may be other things where actually we need to be a salmon. We need to actually be going against where the flow is going. And it's slightly different. It's different from being unmoved. It's saying, no, I'm, I'm going to push back the other way. You know, there might be times where we have to do that. Equally, there may be times where we're just hidden in plain sight, 
where we don't have to be, make a big deal about things. We don't have to, we pick our battles. We pick our battles and we're there and we're ready to respond if we need to. And finally, there are times where we just, and I, it's hard to communicate this one until we actually get there, but there are times where we just have to be honest about, I want to say who we are, that's the wrong way. So look at it, it's not about being honest about who we are, it's being honest about who he is, you know? And there has to be times where we're just unashamedly for the gospel. And uh, we need to be ready to share it and, uh, and all the rest of it. So today, I'm going to be looking at, at anchoring down, holding our ground. And where in our life should we make that the priority? Where in our life should we uh, just say, I'm not going to move from this, but I'm not going to move from this spot. I'm not going to be pushed. And uh, I think a story that kind of brings all of those things into its nature when we look at a character is the story of Daniel. I'm sure most of you know the story of Daniel. Can anyone give me an overview of the story of Daniel, roughly? Does anyone, or, or can you mention some of the big things that happen in the book of Daniel? Any ideas? Feedback, speak to me, come on. What's the famous thing, Daniel in the... Lions, they're never a big one, right? Um, any other stories that you can remember from the book of Daniel? If you, if you don't, I'm going to start giving you lectures about reading your Bible a bit more. The what? Yeah, fantastic. Do you want to share that? I, I... Um, looks like the yeah. illustration to me. Refusing to eat anything from the king's table because it had been sacrificed to God. Brilliant. So we're going to look at a little bit about that this morning. Um, does anyone know what Daniel's name was to the Babylonians? Does anyone know? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Balthazar. And um, we're going to look at that as well in a moment. And the reason why I think this story is really, really good, especially when we're looking at this topic, is because we see a huge culture clash for Daniel. So Daniel is living in Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Judah, and he's been conquered, been conquered by the Babylonian Empire. This is historically true, by the way. So um, I think often people look at the Bible and, you know, one of the arguments is it's not accurate, but it's incredibly accurate. It, the Bible has specific dates. It will tell you who the kings are. It will say how long they reigned for. And then as archaeology catches up, it goes, yeah, that was true. Yeah, that was true. That was true. So this happened. The Babylonian Empire comes along. And you can imagine the life of Daniel changed so dramatically. Because in one moment, and maybe this is how we feel, we're surrounded by people who are like-minded. One moment, the way that I live is very similar to the way of the lives of the people around me. And all of a sudden, this new culture comes in, conquers them, and one of the things they used to do is take the royalty and the higher-ups of society, and they would segregate them, they'd pull them around, they'd spread them around, they'd dilute, they'd dilute um, what they could do, and then they would rename them, and they would basically try and destroy the culture that they had before. So Daniel was now put in a situation, excuse me, <coughs> Daniel was now put in a situation where the culture he is now in is completely alien and it wants to destroy his own culture. Now, does anyone see a bit of familiarity? Anyone feel like, I can relate to this right now? And, but what is amazing about the story of Daniel is that those four things that we looked at in his story... He lives out all four of those principles in different ways. <coughs> there are times where he stands firm. There are times when he goes against the grain. There are times where he just fades in. And there are times where he's available to share truth. And uh, the Babylonian Empire, by the way, uh, the, we talked about um, uh, the, um, the wall around Jerusalem uh, this, you know, actually, this comes a lot later, and how big it was and how impressive it was. This wall in Babylon was humongous. We're talking the thickness, okay, the thickness of 80 feet. 
80 feet. I mean, this is a, a big wall. This kingdom is humongous. <coughs> their infrastructure, their buildings, their statues. Yes, please, that'd be wonderful. <coughs> Praise the Lord for the Christians in the room. <coughs> Thank you so much, Leona. Feeling the love. And what I want to do, I want to read through the first bit of Daniel. And uh, oh, sorry, what I was saying, um, he was, uh, he's been adopted into this culture. There are times where Daniel holds the line, we're going to look at that. There are times where Daniel adopts the culture. There are areas in his life where Daniel adopts the culture. And I think we can learn from I really do. I'm going to cough again. Excuse me. <coughs> Crazy, I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. So let's just read through Daniel 1. And we're going to look at this story. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoi... I've got to say this right. Jehoi... Jehoiakim. That's how you actually say it. Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These were carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So, again, just picture this. Not only has this culture come in, this, this, this warring body has come in. They've taken everything that is seen to have been given to God. They've taken it and they've twisted it. And they're using it now to honor gods that um, go completely against his ways. Then the king ordered Ashpeter. Ashpenaz, chief of his court of officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites and the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, me, uh, showing aptitude of every kind of learning, obviously, uh, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Do you know what? When I read that the first time, I'd love to say that's me, but I was like, man, I wouldn't have been picked. <laughs> I wouldn't have been picked. Anyway, Daniel was. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Again, we see this kind of like, you know, they're going to learn our ways now. We're going to bring them into our culture. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Little cough sweet. Thank you. Legend. Another Christian in the house, everyone. I'll have that in a minute. Um... The king assigned them a daily amount of food. Oh, sorry, if I, oh, yeah, teach them the literature of the Babylonians. So again, picture that, what that looks like. Maybe you can see some familiarity today because we often have this conversation with our children in school and how much control do we have over what's being taught to them, um, over uh, the behaviors that, that they're taught, et cetera. And, and you know, we've been asking lots of questions about that recently. Um, and here we are having the Babylonians doing the same thing to, to the Israelites. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them new names to Daniel, the name Balthasar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of the Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Uh, you should, uh, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would have my head, would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. All the vegetarians use this this as an argument, by the way. Any vegetarians in the house? None. Oh. Wow. Okay. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. 
So he agreed to this, and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were, were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king king talked to them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. That's a lot to take in, but I think it does give us a really healthy overview of Daniel. And um, it highlights a particular story that I want to focus on this morning. And that is this idea, and I'm going to read uh, from from verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And it's really interesting, this whole passage, because on one hand, we see a, a, a set of young men who are being adopted into a culture, and there were certain aspects that they didn't fight back on. <clears throat> For example, the names that they were given. I think it's these bands drying out the air in my lungs. but um, We see this example of these names that are given to them, and they didn't fight back. So, Balthasar, does anyone know what, what his name might mean? It, it means Baal, Baal, protect the king. <clears throat> so, we have, um, and, and even to the others, so... Um, uh, Meshach, I've written this down, so I want to give me a second. Although my notes aren't coming up through the, no. My notes aren't coming up. Um, so Meshach, uh, it basically is, um, uh, it's, it's to another, it's basically, um, a, uh, worshiping another god. Uh, Abednego is to worship the, the god of scribes, which is Nabu. Um, and uh, Shadrach is about um, uh, serving our king. Basically, and you have these names that are given to these people. And basically, imagine that, like, I'm not only am I going to take you out of your culture, but your very name is going to give glory to other gods that aren't yours. I mean, how insulting is that? You know, it's, it, it's just so wrong on so many levels you just couldn't picture anything like that happening today it's just like a direct insult i'm going to conquer you and i'm going to give you a name that tears your god down and gives glory to my god (coughs) yet we don't see daniel respond to that he doesn't say uh don't call me that please it goes against what i believe he didn't do that at all he adopted the name that was given to him. And I'm sure that when they spoke to each other, they didn't use, does anyone mind if I eat the sweet? Is anyone going to mind? You might hear it going against the inside of my teeth. But it's all good. Is that going to work? No? Oh. Um, we, we see them adopting certain levels of, of their culture. Another thing, so Bautishazar, does anyone know what role he's ultimately given by Nebuchadnezzar? Anyone know? The chief of magicians. The chief of magicians. Now, do we think that do we think that Daniel believed in magic in that sense? Do you think he believed in enchantments in that sense? Uh, Does anyone believe that that is Daniel? No. He yet he adopted that part of the culture. He's given this role. And he accepts it. He's given these names and he accepts it. But when it comes to the food, it just says, but Daniel resolved 
not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. I found this so interesting. Why is it on one level he seemed to be just fitting in and looking like everyone else? Yet on this, this particular issue, he decides to make a stand and say, I'm not going to do this. I really don't think this is right. And I, I do think there's something about our personal convictions. Our personal convictions. And what I want us to think about this morning, the area in our life as Christians that I really think we need to hold the ground in, is what God is saying to you directly. So if in some ways, separate your habits, separate your traditions. What are the things that you feel so passionately about? Like God, God wants you to do this, that actually you know this is what you need to do with your life. Therefore, I have to hold the line on this area. I have to stand my ground on this area. And I, I think there's, there's something in that. You know, I love the fact that we all have an individual faith, e- each and every one of us. And all of us, in some way, are impacted and affected by the world that we live in. The way I explained to Ali was, if we looked at that kind of clash of cultures, and you've got these two colors clashing. Well, if God is red and the world is blue, the truth is, if we're all being honest, most of us are a shade of purple. Most, all of us are a shade of purple. We have God in our life. We want to live his way, but we can't help but be impacted by the, the culture that we live in. You know, look at us this morning. We're all wearing very similar clothes. You know, obviously, I'm setting high standards. You know, I look like I'm ready for a summer holiday, you know, but we all wear similar clothes. You know, no one in here is wearing a headscarf. You know, um, is anyone wearing sandals today? Anyone wearing flip, um, what are they called? Flip, not flip-flops, those horrible things with the... Uh, yeah, those things. Um, they're horrible. They're not accepted in this church. No, I'm joking. But, but look around the room. Culturally, we, we're, we're all quite similar. Yet if we were suddenly moved and put in, say, the Middle East, we would stand out a lot just simply by through what we're wearing alone. And this is how we, we can know that our culture has an impact on how, how we live. Isn't it funny that when you're at work, you can have conversations about what's been going on TV, right? Do you remember when that Line of Duty was on TV and it was a big thing, right? Did any, anyone not watch Line of Duty? A couple of people, sinners, that's okay. We'll forgive them. Amazing program. But there was a moment where everybody was talking about it. Like everyone wanted to know who this well, I won't spoil it. Everyone wanted to know who this, this character was. He had all these theories going around. And that one TV program alone was, was getting people to buy certain things. It was getting people to make sure that a certain time of the week they, were, they weren't doing anything else, you know. And our culture always has an impact on us. And I think the danger is sometimes as Christians, we go, hang on a second. The, the world's all falling apart. We've got to just protect what we've got 100%. We can't let any other culture into this box. And actually, that's not necessarily what God calls us to do. I mean, look at the first disciples. What does God do? Go into the world. Go into the world. And he doesn't say, go into the world and and just be a pain and just stand apart. He wants us to live for him. We want to stand apart in, in the way we behave, the way we treat people, the way we love people, all of those things. Actually, culturally, he doesn't necessarily, sometimes he might, he doesn't necessarily need us or want us to, to do that. And I, I one of the, the I'm just going to skip through some of this because um, uh, I, I do like this whole idea when he, he says, test us, you know, test us. And um, I, think, I think there are times where we, we need to test each other. You know, I, I, accountability, uh, you know, I, I'm very passionate about this, about being accountable, finding people that you can be accountable to. Saying, okay, I, I want to hold the line here. So, for example, you know, um, I want to be faithful to my wife. I'm going to hold my line here. You know, culture tells me that actually 
I, I should always be happy. Um, and, you know, if things get too tough, actually, I should do what's best for me. And I need to get out of there and just be with whoever. Okay, that's what culture that we live in, for many of us, certainly the young generation, is, is telling us to do. Now, I don't believe that to be true. I believe that I've made a commitment to my wife. She's made a commitment to me. And I believe that I need to be faithful to her. And despite what culture says, I am going to hold the line in that area. Does anyone dis- disagree? Don't get me wrong. We make mistakes. We mess up. But my hope, my, my, what I'm trying to do is hold the line here. But I can't always do that on my own. I can't always hang in there or, or by myself. I need to be accountable to other people so that they can keep me hot, so they can keep me, uh, uh, they can keep me healthy in the way that I'm thinking. They can keep me disciplined and, 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 and help me on that journey. Do you kind of understand what I'm trying to say? Like We have to get people in our life who are going to say, Shane, how are you doing in this area? Like, you know, how is your marriage at the moment? Are you spending enough time with your wife? What do you need to do to deepen that relationship? I need that. Otherwise, I might end up falling off this, this anchor point that I want to put myself in. <clears throat> Hold me accountable is effectively what he's saying. And uh, one, of the, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, kind of going back to this idea of um, what we're feeling inside, where God wants us to kind of anchor down. And I probably preach on this particular scripture, not necessarily at the front of the church, but to individuals more than any other. It's a piece of scripture which has really helped me to understand the church and the diversity of church and the difficulties of church. And it really helps me to be more patient with other people. And I really, I wish that people would adopt this attitude into all that they do. I think we, our church would be so much more effective, and I think we grow better. And it's from Romans 14. I'm going to read from verse 2. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand and fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them to stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so for the Lord. Whoever regards, well, whoever does so for the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so for the Lord. For they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to the God. And here, this, this scripture has helped me so much. And there's something, like I said before, about personal conviction. Because there's a right and a wrong answer here. But here we had Paul teaching us that for one person, his faith or her faith says, I can only eat certain foods or I can, I've got to treat this particular day in a certain way. And yet to another who equally has a faith, who equally loves God, they say, well, actually, I can eat whatever I want and I can And each day is exactly the same as another. And Paul's teaching us, even though there could be a right and wrong answer there, it's important that you do what you think is right. The thing that that you feel convicted about, the thing that is in your soul, the thing that is in your stomach that sits there and says, actually, you know, I know everyone else says this, but I really feel like this is the right way to do things. (coughs) And I think... I think there's so much wisdom 
in this. I think one of the reasons why I get so frustrated with the church is because we look for any excuse to divide ourselves. It's so frustrating. But you, you know, you can, have, you can have two different denominations, and you, it turns out that they split 100 years ago because they disagreed on one theological point. And it makes me so sad. Do you remember when we did the, we did the, uh, the, the study not so long ago? They said there were 45,000 different denominations um, across the globe. 45,000 different denominations. And, uh, and it's because so many churches, as soon as they disagree on something, rather than thinking about this scripture, where it's, you know, we should be accepting and non-judgmental, we need to uh, encourage them to live out their faith for God in a way that they think is right. Instead of doing that, we go, you're, you're wrong, and I'm right. And, and if you can't agree with me, we can't be friends anymore. We certainly can't worship God together. And I, I, don't, I don't know about you, that really breaks my heart. I think it's one of the reasons why I think the church is in such a sorry state. Because we just look for the, these excuses to, to divide ourselves. And it's... it's Oh, infuriating. What we have to do is learn that if people are doing what they think is right and they genuinely are doing it for the Lord, we've got to cheer them on. Because they're, they're saying, I want to live for the Lord. I want to live for God. Our personal conviction means something. And I thought it would be really good for us this morning is for us to take a moment to ask God where he wants us to anchor down. What is he saying? What, what are the things that are in our soul right now where he's saying, don't move from that place. Stay there. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we never move in our faith. You know, it doesn't mean that, like, I, I will often say to people, if I'm not teaching something slightly different in 20 years, in some of my talks, etc., that's probably a bad sign. Because it means I'm not growing. I'm not developing. My thinking isn't expanding. We're free to move when, when we feel God is taking us in that direction. And that's important. I, I don't think it should be a case of, right, I'm never moving from this, this place ever. Otherwise, we'd never grow, would we? But I think there is something about saying to the Lord, God, I know that you are good, and I really want to do this for you. And if that is, I don't think I should eat meat, I really think I should, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't think it's right. Then, then so be it. And the rest of us should be clapping that person on. Going, go on. You know, you, you keep going. You do what you think is right. If it's, you know, um, maybe some of the other, well, there's, there's loads of stuff. I'm sure you, you and God can have that conversa conversation. But there's something about these, these convictions. So let's just take a minute just to kind of ask God, God, where do you want me to, to stand my ground? Where do, you want me to, where do you want me to just be unmovable right now? What are the things about the culture that I'm living in that are not good for me? An example of that might be telly. That's a big one. Some people in this room hate anything on TV that's not good. Others in this room like Game of Thrones. You know, and, you know, we live in, we, we, we can have different expectations of what we do. But what is God saying to you is okay? And how can we help each other stand firm where we believe that we want to, where we want to stand? Because we can't do it on our own. And there are some things, and we'll talk about this another week, but actually us all together, we need to go. So, for example, if, if someone said, right, Jesus isn't Lord. Well, then we have a different faith. That's a different line. There are certain things that it's like universally like this is the church. But when it comes to the cultural stuff, God, where do you want me to draw the line? God, where do you want me to stand? God, what do you want me to watch or not watch? What do you want me to listen to? Where do you want me to spend my time socially? How do you want me to be around these people? Lord, what do, I, what do you want me to wear? Lord, how do you want me to spend my money? Just 
take a minute. Lord, what influences do I need to have in my life? Lord, what influences do I need to cut out of my life? Lord, what language should I use? Lord, who should I be in my relationship? Lord, how often should I pray? Lord, when do you want me to open your book of life? Bible. Lord, how many Sundays a month should I be at church? How fast should I drive the car on the motorway? Father, we want to be a people that honor you in all aspects of our life. And Lord, we acknowledge that we're far from perfect, that we mess up, we make mistakes. Lord, but you help us be a people that listen to your personal convictions. Lord, we just thank you. Your word says you discipline the ones that you love. Lord, will you help us to stay in tune with what you want us to do, how you want us to behave, what you want us to watch. Lord, that you're interested in every aspect of our life. Lord, may we be a church that is different in the way that we look at each other. Rather, that we don't, we're not about standards. Yes, we're about accountability, but we're not about bashing and pointing fingers and judging. May we be a people that just encourage each other to pursue you, to pursue you, your pursue your will in our life. Bless and praise your name. Amen. And I'm guessing that in that small time, that maybe it was just one thing, maybe it's multiple things, but I'm guessing for most of us, God sat something right here for you. Something that you just like, I know I need to do better in this area. I, I felt it for ages. I know that this area of my life has become really blurry and I don't want it to be. And just to say, first of all, that like, this sweet is delicious. <laughs> but just to say, God's grace is so big. God's forgiveness is never ending. And what we don't want to do is live in a place of guilt, live in a place of I'm not good enough. That's where God wants us to live. It's accepting that none of us are good enough. That's what's so good about, about the gospel of Christ. None of, us, none of us are good enough on our own. We just do the best that we can do. And we ask for God's help in it. And we trust that his grace will 
fill in the places that where we where we just can't we just can't do it on our own.